I start with thanking uh, Professor Bajaj and the entire NAMS team for inviting us here and for the hospitality of Jodhpur. And it's a double advantage for me because I passed out from University of Rajasthan. I'm a product of JLN Medical College, Ajmer. And um, I'm happy to s uh, note that all the previous speakers have laid out an excellent background and I just have to re-emphasize -em on some of the things. As Sujata introduced, the low, medium, and moderate, uh, uh, high regenerative capacity. In pathology, we were taught that all the cells in the body can be divided into three types of cells. The entire six feet or five feet of the body. They're called as labile cells, which, are, which don't require your signaling to divide. They include bone marrow, skin, mucosa. The stable cells are SOS cells, as and when required, and that is the bone, liver, mesenchymal tissues, the permanent cells, till now we believe that they do not divide. We go to the gym, the muscle increases, the number of muscle cells don't increase. So the, skeletal, the examples we were taught is central nervous system, skeletal muscle, cardiac muscle, glomerulus. So the question of repair was never questioned in the labile cells. The question of repair and regeneration was not questioned in liver cells. The question of regeneration is uh, questioned, are still debated in permanent tissues, so-called the central nervous system and skeletal nervous system. But there is evidence that even in these tissues, there are stem cells which can rescue the tissues. So there are unique features. Sujata has given a very good background. And the reason why we are all healthy is because these cells are error-free, error-free. They don't divide rapidly. In fact, they are the underbunker army. They are quiescent. They are in the G0, G1 phase. They only uh, populate as and when required. So one of the things that uh, Dr. Bajaj has been asking, why aren't you asking questions? So a student plays in the play playground, that's the niche for the student. Here it's not the niche. So the important thing of stem cells is extrinsic as well as intrinsic properties. The intrinsic properties are of stem cells. The extrinsic property is the milu which brings out the best in us. And tissue regeneration, like Sujata has emphasized, is cells, the binding material, or the extracellular matrix, and then you have the building. The difference between tissue engineering and a building is the building doesn't have, have to function, whereas an organ has to function. And that is a challenge. And all these introductions have been already done. So we did, there are NIH guidelines. You can see the uh, NIH guidelines. When, how do we? go ahead with cell therapy. When are we ready to go ahead with cell therapy? When we, have, when we have had the clearance from our IRB and ethics committee, when we have adequate number of cells, the desired cell type is made, they survive, network, integrate, function, and cause no harm. And what are the challenges? All the previous speakers have uh, emphasized on the questions that have not yet been answered. And in the, uh, in the area that I work on, Surprisingly, this five, millimeter, uh, five centimeters of tissue in and around the orbit is a very unique organ. When people were asked, what do they fear? They feared blindness rather than death. And the reason is there are many diseases which can cause blindness. Just the corneal scar can be replaced by corneal transplant. Cataract can be removed, intraocular lens can be put. But there are some diseases like the diseases of the retina, the diseases of the optic nerve, the diseases not of the cornea, but the limbus, that is the periphery of the... So the ocular surface regeneration is one of the role models of uh, uh, regenerative medicine and has been hailed as the next to bone marrow transplantation. And these are the different cells which have been used, the limbal cells, which Sujata has talked about, conjunctival cells, oral cells, and direct transplantation. And I would be discussing this, uh, showing few of these. The ocular surface regeneration is a very, very unique organ, and the transparent cornea is compared to the dial of your clock. We regard this limbus as 360 degrees, and uh, it's brown because the cornea is transparent. It's not that the cornea is brown, and the center one is the pupil. And this unique structure is a very unique, this is the conjunctiva at the periphery, the white is the conjunctiva, the line is the limbus, and the center is the cornea. And there are three avascular tissues, cornea, cardiac valves, and cartilage. If they get vascularized, that's the doom of the tissue. So cornea is, uh, is transparent. A transparent tissue doesn't have the right niche 
for the stem cells. So where does nature provide the niche? Na the niche nature provides the niche of these corneal cells at the periphery and that is the 360 degrees. So it's like your storehouse of corneal epithelial cells. So if the cornea is damaged, you can do corneal transplantation. What do you do if the limbus is damaged and what happens if it is damaged? This is what happens. It's like the, I call it, a, you know, the line of control. The, your good neighbor, the Pakistan comes into your Indian army. That's exactly what the conjunctiva does coming onto the corneal surface. And when it comes, it brings along the blood vessels, the fibrous tissue, which you don't want on the cornea. And that is the main problem. How do you deal with this? Cornea is replaced by cornea, limbus has to be replaced by limbus. And where do you get this limbus from? You have to get the limbus from the good eye, if one eye is intact. And this was, these were the previous studies, they were directly taking the limbal tissue and transplanting it. But once we came to know that these are the stem cells, if you apply the property of stem cells, they can divide and uh, replace the tissues. We were not the first groups, the first groups in the world was in Italy, Grazilia Pellegrini, where she uh, transplanted, she took two millimeters of tissue, made it into a sheet of epithelium, transplanted to the ocular surface, and thus restored the ocular surface. Following that, our, our group started in 2000, and we made the same. There were few deviations that we did. We did not use the feeder cells, which other groups have used, because these are from animal source. We took the human amniotic membrane, which is one of the best biological dressing materials. We removed the native cells of the amniotic membrane by enzyme and mechanical scraping, used it as a scaffold, put the explants, cut it into minor, minute bits, explant it, and then watch the cells grow. And instead of using, uh, you know, Invention is the necessity is the mother of invention. We didn't have the culture inserts, so we took a glass slide, tucked the amniotic membrane just like you would tuck a baby at bedtime, and and then we watched the cells grow on these amniotic membrane. And this is, uh, uh, I'm happy to say that this is one of the standard preferred practice patterns, and it's published in Nature Protocol. So this, the explants will uh, grow cells at the edge. They go on to make a monolayer. If you grow them further, they make a multilayered epithelium. If you do the immunohistochemistry, the limbal derived ones make corneal epithelial cells, and you can use all the markers to show that they have stem cells, differentiated cells. And if you remember Sujata's initial question, initial definition, stem cells have to renovate, re renew and differentiate. So when you grow stem cells, you will not have 100% stem cells. You will have stem cells, differentiating cells, and transient amplifying cells. And this is uh, my colleague, Dr. Virendra Sangwan, because of which this whole team, uh, we were able to do this. He took a biopsy from the good eye, and, and there was no donor uh, threat to the donor site. What were the clinical situations that we dealt with? If one eye was damaged, we took the good, good eye, made it into a sheet of epithelium, transplanted it to the patient, and in 40% of the cases, the patient sees. If he doesn't see, because of the deeper scarring, we went ahead with corneal transplantation, and this is one of the reasons why we can show that the cells which we transplanted survive, network, and integrate, and function like cornea. And these are some of the cases where both eyes were damaged. If we had to do direct transplantation, we didn't have choice. But if you can culture them, this little fragment of good tissue, you can take, expand, and treat both eyes. But if both eyes are damaged, you have no choice but to go to another patient. It can be cadaveric or allogenic. And when you do allogenic, you have to do immunosuppression. I think one of the questions of the audience was, what about the rejection? Autologous tissues don't get rejected. Allogenic limbal tissues have to be treated by immunosuppression. And another thing that uh, our country has is extensive damage. And we have done more than 800 patients till now. And 80 to 90 percent of them are chemical burns, which are avoidable. And that's the pity of the thing. And it's not only damages the limbus and the, con and the cornea, but it also damages the conjunctiva. And there was no other paper which addressed this issue. So since we were seeing these cases, we said, how do we address a, a severe damage? We, trans we went ahead and put the limbus in the center, conjunctiva at the periphery, just like you have a normal epithelium. But the cells started merging. So I devised a ring barrier, because limbus acts like a barrier, 
we designed a ring barrier, put the limbal cells in the center, conjunctiva at the periphery, and now we have one, epithe one membrane with two different types of cells separated by a space which acts like a barrier. And this composite, this was the first of its kind where this was transplanted and we could re regenerate these uh, corneas. What's the proof? Unlike the other uh, areas where there is no proof of concept objectively, for we do have very good objective uh, evidence that clinically the vascularization subsides, the eye becomes quiet, there is transparency restored, and in some cases, of course, there is failure. And this is a kaplan meyer uh, curve which is showing the success. These are again some of the cases, and some of the cases, even in such a bone dry case, we had uh, restored it by first limbal epithelial transplantation, subsequently by corneal transplantation, and these patients see six by six. Even after doing corneal transplantation, there is even two procedures also, the patients still do well, as you can see in these two, uh, either after corneal transplantation and after a repeat procedure. And uh, we, as I said, we, our, technique was uh, unique in the sense that it was feeder cell free, xeno free. And we have published the longest uh, follow up of these of 10 year survival. And you can see the comparison between the other groups and ours. And uh, this is a mean of 7.6 uh, years. And this was the first 100 cases that we followed up. And the procedure, uh, the comparative data is mentioned here. If you compare the non-zero from other groups, again, look at the uh, success is anything between 100%, 100%, this is something that there is only one eye, so therefore the number is not enough to give up uh, data. If we compare the first seri published series in the, in the world was by Italy, and uh, we, when we compare the, both the data, they use the suspension technique, we use explant, they, they use feeder cells, we did not use feeder cells, they required other xenograph, we did not use xenobiotics, and the culture duration was same, irrespective of what uh, method you use, the success was comparable. And uh, these are the largest series in the world till date. Uh, now, Sujata mentioned about if both eyes are damaged, where do you get the limbus from? The patient doesn't have. Either you have to go to his parents, a cadaveric tissue, or is there a possibility of using oral mucosa? But this is something I just wanted to uh, emphasize here. Limbal to limbal, liver to liver, bone to bone, no questions asked from one type of a tissue when you apply to a non-homologous tissue all the questions come up. So here we are taking a different, it is autologous yes, but is it a same homologous? No. So oral mucosa could act as a substitute for ocular surface and this was the Japanese group which did it and we followed the same, we did about 19 patients and this is the same bi biological data which we did. But look at this, in 19 cases there's hardly any uh, uh, other than symptomatic relief, which we don't think is an objective way, but there's hardly any improvement in these patients. Less than 30% is the, is, the, uh, uh, is the success. So what was the problem? Limbus is vascular, it survives in avascular cornea. Oral is vascular, it does not survive on avascular cornea. And those are the factors which are uh, the niche derived. So it's just like a baby taking its pillow and sleeping elsewhere. Oral mucosa brings along with it the tuft of vessels. And this is what we don't want. We are working on this. No answer yet. And we have compared the uh, COMET data. It is, uh, it is Nakamura group has said very good success, but none of them have repeated uh, the success. And in our group, it is uh, very less, about 30%. So what did we do to summarize? We took the limbus from the good eye, made it into a sheet of epithelium, transplanted to the ocular surface. If the patient uh, stroma is damaged, we do a corneal transplantation, provide the proof of concept, the cells have survived. And what is the proof of uh, uh, objectives, proof of survival? Clinical evidence, histological data, ultrastructure, in vivo microscopy, and we even did the genotyping to show in allogenic cases that the donor derived. And while doing this, I'm not a basic researcher, but an ob one good observation made a PhD and we made a big difference to understanding of the niche. We observed some spindle cells at the bottom of the flask when we were doing the epithelial cells. And we did a series of studies. We talked about bone marrow mesenchymal cells. And I must share with you that I almost, uh, you know, I asked my student to go out, both of them, because one of them was working on limbal stromal cells, and the other one was working on bone marrow stromal cells. And I thought they have mixed up the flasks. 
We repeated the whole experiment again. So what did we show in this study is that the mesenchymal stem cells which we derived from the limbal stroma and what we observed in the bone marrow are exactly the same. The limbal epithelial cells are HLADR positive but limbal stromal cells are HLADR negative and that's the very characteristic feature of mesenchymal stromal cells and that's the reason why they are being Im used as immunomodulators after transplantation. So is it just of an academic interest? No, it is not because these can be used as feeder cells and they can probably what uh, Sujata was talking about uh, of a 3D cornea. So far we made 2D epithelium. If we want to make a 3D cornea, these stromal cells are going to go into that scaffold and one of them, there are different type of scaffolds you can use and uh, my best bet was on the uh, Canadian uh, May Griffiths derived transparent collagen which has shown very good success and this probably is one of the reasons. Epithelium success story, retina not a success story. The reason? It's a very complicated structure which uh, the, uh, Padma has already very clearly emphasized. So what are the retinal diseases? It's nothing but an extension of central nervous system. You have age-related macular degeneration, retinitis pigmentosa, glaucoma, and what has been used? Fetal cells have been explored, embryonic stem cells have been explored, IPS has been explored. So one of the very simple, uh, and this was the, you can read this, we had many questions as was already uh, raised and we have reviewed that any cell can be used but the questions asked are the same. Will they survive? Will they integrate? Will it be accepted? And my approach was through bone marrow. We tried all the things that uh, previous speakers have told. We, grown, we have grown them. We showed adipogenic differentiation, osteogenic differentiation, neuronal differentiation, proved them but then what? Everything that looks like neural, does it function like neuron? No, we don't have the answer yet. And that's where we got stuck up and we did not show the electrophysiology. There's another debate to this. Developmental biologists don't accept that the neurons can get through a lateral entry into the system. This is a, like stromal cells or skin cells, can they directly have a lateral entry into the neural pathway? The one school of thought supports it, one school of thought negates it. And being scientists, uh, we have to look at both options. RP transplantation, what is the progress? A very simple thing. The, the RP, if you, if you remember the camera or the eye, the main focus is on the macula. So you have a retinal pigment epithelium at the periphery. So a very smart move was, can you pick, pick the turn it like a, a camera, like you modify the pictures and see if you can get the RP cells uh, into that. So in addition to macular translocation, there's also macular transpla RP transplantation and this was done by Susan Binder from uh, Vienna where they took the biopsy from the retina from the periphery and injected into the central, uh, into the macular area where it is damaged. And it's, is it only RP cells? You can even take it from the iris. In all glaucoma surgeries, if you recall, iris biopsy is done. This iris biopsy can also be used to expand, make into sheet of epithelium and transplant it. This is not my work, this is the other group's work. And we've already talked about uh, IPS cells. And these IPS cells, is it a myth? Um, uh, those of you who have been following, uh, this is Masayu Takahashi. And uh, she's from Riken, one of the very promising institutes in Japan. And they have, I, work, I watched her work in animal experiments and now they have published their first pilot uh, clinical trial using IPS for eye diseases. So it's no more in uh, academic interest. It's also, they have derived the same way. Uh, from four genes, it has come to now, I think two or one gene from viral method to non-viral method and now it is almost through peptide induced also. So you can reduce all the complications of IPS and what she has done is now she will be transplanting RP into the patients. Glaucoma is another neural disease which I mentioned to you about. What happens is the pre pressure, we, in, we were taught as uh, students that glaucoma is nothing but higher IO intraocular pressure. High intraocular pressure is just a symptom. What happens is a neuronal damage and the loss of the ganglion cells. And here, there is no regeneration. Penny saved, penny earned. So if you save ganglion cells, you can, neuroprotection is the way, not much of neural regeneration. And this neuroprotection can be done both by pharmacological means and by uh, immunological means. 
optic nerve degeneration there are isolated case reports where they have used bone marrow autologous bone marrow in uh, in optic neuritis especially multiple sclerosis those of you know and autologous mesenchymal cells have been also been in, uh, injected with there are only case reports not a large series and there's a very interesting paper it's not just few cells the entire eye has been regenerated using the embryonic stem cells and this is a fascinating uh, progress but not only in bench work the last part of the uh, potential of uh, cell therapy or regeneration in ophthalmic diseases is the dry eye those of you uh, who must be facing using contact lenses or computers we have lot of dry eye and uh, the dry eye is because the tear film is absent and this tear film is formed by lacrimal gland goblet cells and meibomian glands and this is uh, the tear film constitution which has a uh, a mucous layer aqueous layer and a lipid layer and it has been well worked out so this was a, a question given to us uh, by international atomic energy agency and that question i answered that i'll try to do uh, stem cell therapy for lacrimal gland and when we reviewed there was no uh, uh, human study on human lacrimal gland and that's when uh, our project was supported by iaea and what we did is we took the human lacrimal gland grown them into spheres made them into sheets they even look like ductal epithelium acinar cells we did the immunohistochemistry to show that there are stem cells and we also made spheres from what is called as the lactospheres and we showed the secretory granules in these cultured cells not only that tears have to be secreted even if i mean the cells have to cry to show that they have tears and we showed that the condition media has all the uh, constitutions of tear lysozyme secretory iga and lactoferrin which is published now in plus 1 do they have stem cells yes we have documented for the first time that the lacrimal gland cultures have stem cells is it just um, is it a hype or a hope if you follow that three organs which are following the same track pancreas salivary glands and lacrimal gland in in salivary glands the dry mouth so you can culture these salivary glands silospheres they are called and there is a uh, attempt by robert cops from uh, netherlands they are trying to make a, a capsule and encapsulated capsule in which you have cells and that can be put into the mouth or subconjunctiva to rescue dry eye or dry mouth so our interim results which are very promising that it is feasible they show stem cells and they show secretory product and there is a potential to transplant this later on what are the future directions as i said pancreas all these exocrine glands have to be capsulated the advantage of capsule is uh, the secretory substances can come out the immune cells can't go and reject them and this is the future and live cell as has already been mentioned using of new scaffolds um, and live cell imaging is a challenge and instruments of dam of cell delivery is another thing in ophthalmology the rpe cells have been delivered by a new a special instrument and that has led to a, a huge success and in the evidence based medicine as we all know we have to follow we have to show where we do we stand and how robust is our data to show and most of these data are at actually the bottom of the pyramid most of the data is in in vitro or animal experiments case reports and a couple of the randomized clinical trial with dr uh, uh, balram was showing and there is uh, there are randomized clinical trial not the results have not yet been published in all the cases but majority of the stem cell trials are at the bottom of the pyramid and the best thing would be to have a very good systematic review and uh, i would like to summarize that all of us have learnt a lot that we have we, we think we know a lot about stem cells we know culture techniques we know how the disease process works how the pathobiology but it's actually a team work if we understand all this then that's the key to going towards regenerative medicine in ophthalmology nimble stem cell therapy is heralded as the successful story of regenerative medicine because it's simple it is visible it is documented and proof of principle was very uh, uh, easily provided and it was nearer to clinical application but ips cells is we have to wait for uh, the riken group to see show the results and uh, with our increasing uh, non communicable diseases i think tissue engineering is the way to go and this is the most important slide of my presentation this is i call it my mini infantry these are all my students who have taught me 
by uh, and we all looked at the cells together and uh, many of them have uh, obtained their PhD and uh, thanks to Virendra Sangwan, my surgical partner who did the surgeries and the funding, ag funding agencies and for LV Prasad though I am at the University of Hyderabad now I continue to go as visiting faculty and this is the pyramidal model of eye care and this entire team which has led to this success. Thank you very much for your patient listening.